Okay, let's start our today's plenary session. I hope we have fourth day today, so I hope you are getting everything what is needed from this conference, your contacts, your communication, setting up new projects, and I hope you take everything the best from Krakow. Let's start this session, which is a Tycho Brahe medal session, and we will be having a distinguished lecture by uh, the awarded person, and today, uh, to, this year, the Tycho Brahe Medal 2023 grows to Anton Zenzus for major advances is very, in very long baseline interferometry that led us for the first image of the black hole shadow in M87 galaxy and in our own galaxy. And now is a time for lecture, for achieving a medal. <clears throat> and for the lecture, lecture on a title, um, Pushing Limits and Breaking Records, 55 Years of VLBI. Anton. The floor is yours, the screen is yours, microphone is yours. Thank you. Dear Professor Davis, colleagues, Agatha, it's a uh, deep honor for me to receive the Tycho Brahe Medal today, and I thank the European Astronomical Society for this exceptional recognition. Credit is due to my Bonn research team and staff and to the many collaborators and colleagues around the world in our uh, achievements. The Max Planck Society's trusting support for over 25 years in my current role has been uh, fundamental likewise. And I wouldn't be here without the support of my loving wife, my family, my friends, and my mentors. Today, I want to share the journey that we did in the in advancing the technique of very long baseline interferometry for the imaging of the shadows of supermassive black holes. This achievement is at the center of the work of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, but it is also central to the achievements of many more people. I will not theorize, but focus on the elements of the, on the observational elements building upon the exceptional lectures, the insightful and exceptional lectures yesterday of Professor Monika Mojibotska and earlier Reinhard Genzel. And I refer you to the special session tomorrow on more scientific results from the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, right at lunchtime. Okay. I want to start with the press uh, echo on the two announcements that the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration made in 2019 for M87 and uh, in 2022 last year for Sagittarius A-star respectively. You may have seen these. You may have seen this in your country around the world. And uh, even though we had a fair amount of press work building up to these events, it was astonishing for all of us how positive and how interested the reception of this was, not just in the public, but also in the scientific community. So for many of us in this particular collaboration, this was uh, two very special moments. So what have we done? We had set out decades earlier to study the centers of galaxies with a technique that was by that time fairly well established, very long baseline interferometry, and we advanced that technique to a point that we were able to make images of uh, the central region right around the suspected black hole in these two galaxies. But I want to go back 100 years and start my journey with uh, US astronomer uh, Heber Curtis, who in 1918 published optical observations from the Lick Observatory of the nebula Messier 87 that showed a mysterious streak of emission emanating from the central object. This work didn't get a whole lot of attention at the time, and in fact, not so many people or no one really knew 
well the nature of galaxies and how they, how they um, were formed and existed. This is only 100 years ago and there was a lot of things unknown about these. Now, by now, of course, this is all for us commonplace. At this conference alone, there's many, many contributions talking about the galaxies, the supermassive black holes, but at that time, this was all new and Heber was involved in the great debate with Shapley, among others, uh, arguing about what the possible nature of these objects were. By 60 years later, radio astronomy had become an established field. In fact, only a decade after Heber's work, Karl Jensky in the US founded the field of radio astronomy by understanding that interference signals of his antenna at the Bell Laboratories actually originated from the galaxy, the Milky Way. And that founded a field, a new field, besides the optical uh, window of the Earth, a new field where we could from Earth observe the heavens in astronomy and ultimately observe the distant objects. Uh, Forty years later, it was of course known that there were galaxies and in the 60s, the ideas were sort of 50 years after Einstein proposed his theory of general relativity, the ideas that the centers of galaxies might hold massive, supermassive black holes was part of a well-established par paradigm. Radio telescopes were therefore a new, opened a new window, a new technology, but also a new scientific window into the universe, but with the slight disadvantage that they were limited by angular resolution. Even a very large telescope like this Effelsberg telescope in Germany, where I work, uh, have, has only the resolution comparable at uh, centimeter wavelengths uh, to, the, uh, to the human eye. In fact, incidentally, this is comparable to what Tycho Brahe might have had to uh, use for his uh, observations, which were made by eye and uh, before the times of telescopes. But there was a technique, connected element radio interferometry, that allowed imaging of these objects, these distant objects, in particular allowed imaging of the jets like the one that we had seen in M87 earlier. And uh, by, this, by the 80s, uh, it was possible with radio interferometry here, an image of the VLA of M87 next to the space telescope image of M87, um, these connected element interferometry observations allowed exquisite to measure exquisite detail in the jets of these extended and the structures of these extended sources. Uh, this, the extent of the structure that we see here on the right is about 200,000 light years, enormous. So what had happened? Building on or rooted in his work in radar during the war, Martin Ryle had developed since the 40s, um, only a few years after radio astronomy was found as an astronom astronomical field, uh, he developed interfer interferometric methods to, use, to combine telescopes by cable and use them to do interferometry to achieve higher resolution in the position determination and the size measurements of objects. This, um, when he, this, he did this early work in Cambridge and in 1974 he received the Nobel Prize for establishing radio interferometry as, an, as a well-established method to do high resolution imaging. Critical for these were not just the use of telescopes uh, at, at a certain distance connected by cables, but also the exploitation of the rotation of the Earth and the concept of aperture synthesis. And then going beyond the connected element interferometry with which with the instruments such as Bank, the Merlin, now Merlin interferometer, but also the very large array in the US, going beyond these connected element interferometries in the 60s, colleagues developed, the pioneers of this area developed the method of very long baseline interferometry. The cables went away, the telescopes were no longer connected, the data from these individual telescopes were digitized, recorded, and later combined at uh, computers that we refer to as correlators. The correlated data were calibrated and the Fourier transform of the data, uh, Fourier transform of the data is actually the brightness distribution, the image of the sources on the sky. The method in the beginning again used to determine precisely positions ultimately to uh, accuracies of centimeters and less but then increasingly also to study the structure of objects. Here in this image you see 
uh, a sketch of two of these antennas that receive the radio signals. Important is that the, there's a difference in the arrival time which has to be compensated for in the correlator and that the uh, data are not just recorded but they're also marked with precision timestamps uh, driven by hydrogen maser clocks. That's the basic principle uh, method behind it, very complicated, but the essential elements are the precision frequency standards, the clocks, and the broadband data acquisition uh, that were used. At that time, broadband meant uh, megahertz in bandwidth. So VLBI, when it matured by the 80s, had enabled uh, routine parsec scale imaging by the establishment of coordinated network observations actually around the world. In various areas, there were networks of telescopes, existing telescopes, new telescopes that were used for this method. In Europe, in the early 80s, we founded the European VLBI network and um, combined a number of the existing large telescopes that had by that time been established in Europe to a network that would routinely observe not just AGN, but a whole suite of different types of objects. So VLBI had become a mainstream operation. In Europe, we founded a few years later the Joint Institute for VLBI, which is hosted in Dwingelo. And incidentally, the new director of JIVE is Professor Aga Stowikowska, who is here with us from Torun Observatory. And Torun Observatory in Poland is one of the founding members of the European VLBI network. So Poland has a very, very uh, dense connection to VLBI since the early days in Europe. The result often was extremely sharp images that exceeded the quality of the optical uh, images by factors of thousands and even 10,000 in the case of M87. For a number of years, we studied the properties of the extended jets, fine structure, we observed filamentary structure, we uh, began to be able to contrast the theoretical models, Monica talked about some of those yesterday actually, uh, with the actual observations. But the central core, is the nature, the region, and the resolving the central core remained uh, elusive. We had detailed jet imaging, and here uh, uh, the best that could be done in the late 80s of M87 with a world array spanning the entire planet with dozens of antennas, and even using space VLBI antennas, an antenna in space with a Japanese satellite that brought, as you see, a lot of fine detail into the understanding of the jets. Now, how about the center? We knew from the by then well-established black hole paradigm uh, what to expect. The black hole paradigm, it was discussed, I'm not gonna dwell on this here, characteristic with the event horizon structure, the singularity in the middle, and the photon ring that was expected to give rise to a mission that would somehow one might be able to, to measure and in fact image. And it was French astronomer Jean-Pierre Luminet, who already in 1979 they did full relativistic calculations to predict what the structure of the uh, event horizon region around the black hole would be. In 2000, besides other work that was done, Falke, Emilia, and Algo were able to predict, uh, the, in, in a similar way, to predict the structure that would be possible to measure with VLBI instruments uh, given sufficient resolution and sensitivity. And it was already clear by then that the images that we would see would be primarily dictated by mass and rotation of the black hole and not essentially, or not in an essential way, by the gas distribution for the arrays that one could conceive. So this is where around 2000s and late 90s, the community realized that the quest had to be to increase the by then established um, resolution of VLBI instruments and also the sensitivity by any possible technical way. One of the paths we pursued, actually pursued in like all these operations in global collaborations was uh, another space VLBI mission, the Russian radio astron satellite in planning for decades were, was launched in 2011 and operated for a number of years and it offered the possibility to extend the VLBI baselines, the distance between these antennas, uh, to the, basically to the, to the distance to the moon. 350,000 kilometers was the size of the elliptical orbit that was, um, that was possible. And that promised a resolution on the scale of 12 or so micro arc seconds at one centimeter wavelength. So ideal for the 
predict for to to um, test the predictions that had been made for in fact M87 and the center of our own galaxy where the known masses of the supermassive black hole or in the case of M87 the, the estimated masses were known uh, to be um, and, and therefore the event horizon scale could be derived numerically very easily. This was great, but despite record-breaking quality in the, in the imaging, because of, in the case of M87, and I stick a lot to M87 here just to keep this, uh, this path simple, in the case of M87, we, we made detections of the signals up to a baseline of five Earth diameters. But the complication of the uh, Fourier, of, of the image quality, the data quality, I should say, and the difficulties in deriving the images made it impossible to actually resolve reliably the central region. So no, we were not able to resolve and image the event horizon scale structure in this object with the means of space VLBI. So the one remaining option to reach the required 20 or so micro arc second resolution was terrestrial VLBI at millimeter wavelengths. Millimeter observatories had also been developed since the 60s. They were high precision instruments capable to go at one, less than one millimeter and even up to uh, wavelengths, even up to terahertz wavelengths. They were partly used on airplanes and satellites, but a number of these telescopes are spread around the world and did individual single dish telescope. Since the 90s, we worked on combining these instruments that hadn't been traditionally used for VLBI uh, for, for early VLBI tests, especially in Europe, the IRAM 30 meter telescope on Pico Valletta and the IRAM interferometer in the French Alps, today called NOEMA, the Northern Element, Extended Element Millimeter Array. And uh, in my, our institute, we, uh, with the prospect of the ALMA observatory going to Chile, we put uh, a telescope on Chatnantor right next to the ALMA site, the Apex Observatory. These antennas became the core of the global network that is now known as the Event Horizon Telescope. But first, they were used at a uh, wavelength, we have been using them at a wavelength of three millimeters, which from the classical centimeter wavelengths was the next logical step. And here is a picture of what we operate routinely, the global millimeter VLBI array organized uh, by, the, by the Max Planck Institute in Bonn. And that is an array that, alike to the very long baseline array, alike to the European VLBI network operates routinely and it can achieve imaging resolution of 50 micro arc seconds at three millimeter wavelengths. Not quite enough, but a step towards where we needed to go. The game changer for our work was the ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. 5,500 meters altitude in Chile. 64 times the apex antenna, 12 meters antenna, a formidable instrument, the, the game changer for what we were going to do. That was the time when we were able to actually take the leap and define and, and realize the Event Horizon Telescope. The, the pre-work for this had been going on in Europe and the US and elsewhere for more than a decade previously. But in 2015, we realized we had all the elements that we needed to make an observation of a network of antennas, 1.3 millimeter wavelength with that 20 micro arc second resolution that we were going for. And so we arranged a collaboration of institutions around the world and we also arranged a large science collaboration of by now hundreds of people that all collaborated and all worked together towards one experiment in the April of 2017 which had at the core the observations of M87 and um, Sagittarius A star, the galactic center. We had to meet, and this is not unique to the Event Horizon Telescope, this is, this is the case in all VLBI, but it is especially difficult the higher the wave, the shorter the wavelength is. We had to meet a number of, of challenges. The first was technical. We had to manage to phase these 64 ALMA antennas together into one large uh, aperture that could be used as one element in the VLBI uh, array. We had to devise new backends to Im increase the bandwidth that had started from megahertz, as I said earlier, to now 30 and more gigahertz bandwidth. We had to find new rec develop new, rec new recorders, develop new backends, 
and we had to sort out the best possible weather conditions as these sites. This is the Alma site on the right, but it's one site where even, even, if, and, uh, where, where even there you have uh, bad weather at times. We had to organize the data transport, the correlation, we had to find new, as a team, imaging approaches to deriving the structure from our um, VLBI data, and we had to work together from the outset with theories on that Monica showed this beautifully yesterday that applied GRMHD theory to the predicted observations and that were ready to compare the actual observations with the, with the predictions. Um, the network spanned from Europe to Chile to the South Pole and to, um, to um, Hawaii. And, uh, all these antennas came together and beautifully, nature not only provided us within that period excellent or reasonably good weather conditions for a coordinated observations, but also none of the or most of the technical problems we had anticipated didn't occur. We had a window of opportunity that was unique. There's a data set from these observations which is second to none in our field. And after two years from these observations, we were able to go one step beyond the earlier three millimeter observation of M87 where we saw the classical core, core jet structure bifurcated in the case at higher resolution uh, of, of the lower panel here and we made uh, the first image where we saw not the jet anymore but the central structure, the ring structure that's so characteristic of the signature of, and the, is comparable to the expected characteristic of the signature of a supermassive black hole at the mass of about six. 0.3 billion solar masses. Um, great breakthrough. It demonstrated the correctness of the notion of the existence of supermassive black holes in galaxies. It allowed the comparison of the GRMHD modeling, confirmed the, the interpretation as the uh, signature of a black hole with an accretion disk, and it allowed the first, the beginnings of tests of GR as well. Three years later, in 2022, we published the Sagittarius A star image, and that's even more scientifically important than the number one picture. It's the number two picture only, but it is the one that could clearly be compared with the work of Reinhard Gensel that he described, and Andrea Guest that earned them the Nobel Prize with their teams. Uh, the signature of this object very much is consistent with the prediction of the well-known mass in the galactic center of 4.1 million solar masses. So here, we, in, in one swoosh, we could support the notion that the compact mass that they could derive from the stellar motions actually was concentrated on an area that most likely was occupied by a supermassive black hole. And from the properties of these observations, we could go beyond and rule out at least some of the models of alternative models to this being interpreted as a black hole. This is important because we now reach, reach a time where VLBI, the, the infrared uh, studies of the galactic center in particular, but also gravitational waves, all come together at the same time to give us different angles together with the multitude of observational tracers that we have to study objects to actually uh, what, create what I like to call a golden age of uh, black hole research. research. VLBI makes a critical or can make a critical com uh, contribution to that work through the highest resolution image. Now, the images we make, and if you look at them carefully, they are not particularly precise. They are uh, nice looking because we, looked, uh, we chose a nice color scheme, but they are, they are actually pretty fuzzy, and they don't allow the precise measurements. Rainer talked about that in his case that we'd like to do. On the other hand, the precision of the infrared uh, observations is incredible but it probes regions, the stars that they probe are factors of 2,000 further away from the black hole structure than, than our imaging. Nonetheless, it is possible to overlay, uh, Magic Wilgus has, will talk about that work too, I think tomorrow, uh, to, to now to do the first steps to connecting the possible signatures of blobs of, of uh, features around the central region with features that we might see, that we identify in the existing images and might see in, in images of the future. Where do we go from here in this field? I have a couple of minutes left. Uh, 
there's many th directions in which this field is expanding. It is not just the EHT with, uh, with the black hole studies. Actually, what I've showed you as a progression in the field of VLBI is applicable to all the other uh, endeavors that we have. In one particular approach that I pursue in my M2 Finders project with the team that I've built is we try to go further in the studies of the polarized structure. Monica talked yesterday about the the polarized imaging that we already can do with the EHT and we want to take that further and image for a number of nearby objects, uh, strong enough objects, the uh, magnetic field structure in the, in the inner 1000 gravitational radii. For that too we need to and will develop new imaging methods, for that too we need modeling and so just like in the case of the EHT collaboration, once again we have nowadays a combination of the observing technologies most of these people are actually te uh, technical instrumentalists that work on, these, on this equipment together with uh, astronomers and astrophysicists. Going forward, the EHT will, in the next decade or so, improve its resolution. In the next few years, improve resolution numbers of antennas that we can use to get better sensitivity, image quality, and add the movie making that we heard about yesterday. And in possible future incarnations, we'll have many more antennas dedicated, building a dedicated array at this uh, one millimeter, but also shorter wavelengths, uh, alike to the routine operations that we have that I described earlier that we have had since the 80s. There's a there's a path towards making this a non not a, uh, to transforming this from a specialized instrument into an instrument that all astronomers can more easily use than it's currently possible. The GMVA already, we pu just published this a few weeks ago, has, looking, has uh, with data taken, from data taken with ALMA, been able to also resolve the central structure. Of course, very much enlightened by the comparison with the, with the EHT results, but there you see that with the already routine open access operation in Europe, we're able, or centered in Europe, we're able to um, do interesting not just black hole or event horizon scale uh, research, but now again interesting research combining the central core and the jet. The central question there that we still haven't answered is how do the jets answer ultimately? How do the jets uh, get formed and how do they evolve? We heard earlier in the week about the SKA. There's also the NGVLA and space missions that may open yet new parameter spaces in this field by adding new antennas. For the EHT, it would be wonderful to have uh, at least one, but even two or three free-flying instruments that would dramatically improve the sharpness, the, the uh, precision of our imaging. The long wavelength instruments of the SKA will also, in their own right, add new opportunities for VLBI. So we'll see in this field where we have technical developments that, went, that took us from the single baseline instruments of the 60s or 50s and 60s to the radio-linked interferometers at, in Merlin in the 70s and 80s to the networks in the 90s, we will see at long and very short wavelengths totally different astrophysical phenomena that benefit from observations with this technique. So, as I come to the end, over 25 years we have observed, uh, we have advanced the astronomical possibilities uh, with uh, VLBI in the sense of resolution from parsec scale resolution to event horizon resolution. At the same time, this technique has been used, and I have not spoken about this, in geodesy for the precise measurement of the Earth parameters, for the precise measurement of um, structures on Earth, the crustal dynamics projects in, in particular, and this method is, has transformed high-resolution radio astronomy into a field that is applicable in a wide way. I consider that a fantastic achievement that is, I want to stress, not just the achievement of this particular team that worked for a number of years are still working on, on doing the highest possible resolution. It is, in fact, not all the result of work of teams. This is a field where I still know some of the people who, since 20 years ago, have been doing development, technical and software development, that a whole community relies on. So also the Event Horizon Telescope community relies on the achievements of many other people in the field all around the globe. It is nice to be able to, it's nice to know and to work with a lot of these people. It has been a pleasure for me to work with many of these people in all these uh, combinations. 
And as I end, I want to make one connection to Tycho Brahe. Here are the two images again of the black hole structures, and here is drawn on the, the images the uh, positions of the uh, of solar system bodies. And so you could say, in a way, the black hole images span solar uh, dim dimensions uh, comparable to the solar system planetary orbits. That is that is what. Tycho Brahe 500 years ago tried to understand the motion of the, or tried to measure precisely. Precision measurements was his thing. Precision management measurements is our thing. Working with theorists was his thing as well. His work was tremendous, a tremendous body of measurements that enabled Johannes Kepler to develop his framework. It was, Brahe without Kepler is difficult for me to, to keep because, uh, of course, Kepler is the one, and we're in Poland, who uh, was the starchest, starchest defender of the Copernican worldview in opposite to Brahe's view. So Brahe's contribution was precision experimentation. Kepler's contribution was uh, ingenious theory. The two left a legacy that, has, that is still with us after 500 years. That's still in, in Kepler's system as a, as a self-consistent theoretical system that allows as Reinhardt explained very precisely the motions of the stars around the black hole. And only when you get into the regime of strong gravity do you need extensions of the theory. It is uh, very nice to be uh, in some way connected or in some connection in a, as a legacy to the work that these people do. And on behalf of all of us, I thank you for your attention. Thank you for this wonderful talk. Questions? Comments? Here, please, on the back. It's hard to see. Yes. So uh, that was a very nice talk. Uh, you were talking at the end about the possibility of a, a satellite that would complement EHT. Uh, what kind of satellite orbit would that be on to be able to provide substantial complementarity? And are you worried about the variability versus the orbital time scale for the satellite, uh, meaning that would be a, a huge challenge to actually uh, implement it into the EHT? I, I didn't entirely hear the end of what you said, but uh, the, the satellite, I, I, there's various concepts that have been put forward. We put a, forward, a concept forward in Europe where to first order, uh, you, you build on several, uh, not just one as in the case of all the other space VLBI missions that we have, but uh, two or more free flyers. That would allow you to have these instruments actually work independently and not necessarily with the ground or also with the ground and allow you to do fast imaging. They would, they would uh, you would have not a tremendously large orbit like Radio Astron, but probably in my mind something more like the orbits of uh, the Japanese Halka satellite. So 20,000 or so kilometers, so that you have as fast as possible, variability is the concern, a uh, filling of the UV plane for much more precise imaging that we could do off the ground. So as you saw in the, in the Radio Astron data, uh, image that I made, if, if you have these very extended orbits, just with a few antennas, you get in the, uh, into the difficulty of the unfilled aperture space. I think a nicely filled and appropriate to the, to the dimensions of, of Sergei Stan M87 and similar objects, uh, filled aperture is what you want to achieve. Uh, variability is a concern, and variability is the prime reason why it took us three more years to get the teams to, to come up with an agreement on what the actual publishable image structure would be. So we have to, do the, to combine the measurements with forward modeling of the variability uh, changes that uh, you might expect. And, and do you have to use a highly eccentric orbit to be able to get the telemetry down? I, th I heard you asked about the, uh, getting the telemetry, so... Yeah. Um, Do you have to make the orbit highly eccentric so that you get close enough to Earth to transmit the data down, or is there a novel approach to transmitting the data? Um, 
Telemetry was not a problem in the case of, of radio Aston where we went all the way to the moon. So you'd have to have the uh, downlink signals. Of, the problem is not so much, it, the problem is, is uh, primarily going to be the bandwidth of the data that you want. If you want to have very large bandwidth, as in the uh, case on the ground, then it will take a while to download. So we'll have periods where you either you find a very fast way of downlinking. Uh, or you find uh, periods where you don't observe and downlink stored data. Okay. I hope I tried to, I, I hope I, I, I covered most of what you were asking. I think the question is quite difficult to solve it now. Mark, do you have a question? No? Another question? Comments? Okay. So let's thank our speaker again. And I would like to invite Roger Davies, president of EAS, to run General Assembly. And all EAS members, please welcome to this hall.